The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, insufficient human sacrifices in Kansas and Nebraska lead to cancellation of sunrise in parts of the Midwest on winter solstice. Guiding stars to get your jolly on, jingling sleighs with guns and rockets. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with Frank Chadwick discussing Come the Revolution, Frank's sequel to science fiction novel, How Dark the World Becomes. Frank discusses the intricate future world he has created and the um, characters that fill this noir science fiction thriller. It's a really good book, and we have a really interesting discussion. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Here's the news. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Some great stuff coming up in 2016. We have a new entry in David Weber's Multiverse series in the spring. Long awaited, that one. It's called Road to Hell. Next summer, we have a really cool Larry Correa and John Ringo collaboration on a new subseries in the Monster Hunter universe. That's called Monster Hunter Memoirs Grunge. Also this summer, yours truly, Tony Daniel, will have a debut young adult high fantasy out, The Dragon Hammer, which I wish you would go and beg your local libraries to purchase right now. It's kind of C.S. Lewis meets Game of Thrones, and it doesn't have any cuss words in it, but good bit of violence. Also in 2016, Eric Flint delivers a big new solo Ring of Fire novel on the Ottoman Empire, which I believe is he's going to call the Ottoman Onslaught. And yes, a new solo Honor Harrington novel by David Weber awaits in the fall. It's called Shadow of Victory. And, and, and so much good stuff awaits. Get ready, get set, have a wonderful, healthy, and prosperous 2016. And read lots of good books, many of which we can supply. want to welcome Frank Chadwick to the podcast. Hey, Frank. Hi, Tony. Uh, Frank Chadwick is the New York Times number one best-selling nonfiction author of over 200 books, articles, and columns on military history and military affairs, as well as over 100 military and science fiction board and role-playing games. He's a famous game designer. His game Space 1889 was the first steampunk game and remains a cult favorite. Frank's other game writing credits include legendary fantasy game On Guard, groundbreaking SF role-playing game Traveler the New Era, and lots of others, many others. Frank's SF novels, which we are concerned with here, include How Dark the World Becomes and steampunk thriller The Forever Engine. And now, at Booksellers Everywhere, is the sequel to How Dark the World Becomes. That book is Come the Revolution. Frank, uh, I love the opening paragraph of Come the Revolution, which reads, uh, I killed 22 people by the time I died. Hadn't killed any since. Some claim that was due to lack of opportunity, but I wasn't sure. It's great stuff. Um, what is Sasha talking about here? Can you bring us up to uh, what the present is in Come the Revolution? I, I love that opening too. I mean, uh, it, it, all of us kind of struggle over openings, and you know, think about them. And I and and that's my it, that's the favorite one I've I've written. Yeah. Um, it really sets the tone for uh, Sasha's character as well. It, it sets the tone for Sasha's character. It tells you something about the world in which he lives, which is a pretty violent place, or at least the place the world he used to live in. Um, and it and it it all harkens back to his experiences in the first novel. Um, how dark the world becomes, where he was, at, at that time, he was a gangster, basically, um, uh, and, and, and in a pretty violent, uh, in a pretty violent environment, and grew up in a tough environment, and uh, spent a lot of the novel trying to get out of that environment, um, and, and, and at the end of the novel was killed, but was, but was frozen and then reanimated. 
Um, so his comment, I killed 22 people by the time I died, refers to the fact that he basically dies at the end of the novel, but then, but then comes back. Yeah. And this takes place... Uh, it's very good that he comes back since it is written in first person. <laughs> that's, that's right. It would be, it would be cheating. Uh, I think Leon Uris did that once in Trinity, where he wrote the whole novel in first person until the last chapter because the, the narrator got killed at the end of the second of the last chapter, which I thought was not one of his better novels, not one of his better moves. Um, but uh, the, uh, this, this novel takes place a couple of years afterwards, um, after he has come back, and he's in a different situation now, but this gives you a sense of kind of what he, what, what he thought he escaped, um, but obviously you can't ever completely escape your past, can you? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's that's what he comes from. Yeah, he's in a he's in in uh, how dark the world becomes. He um, became the the guardian of um, of an alien uh, girl child or two actually, and uh, a girl a, a girl and a, uh, and her brother, yeah, yeah. Baraki and Twiza. Yeah. yeah, and we start the book with um, with. Um, that same situation that uh, How Dark the World Become had um, still still being in trouble. Um, I guess we'll talk more about that momentarily. But tell us more about Sasha's. Uh, you, you, you hinted at his tough childhood and his past. Um, yeah, his, uh, his childhood is... Uh, um, when I was writing about his childhood, uh, I was thinking of kind of some of the homeless children in, uh, in, 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 that I've read about in, in Brazil, Brasilia, in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, and also the uh, kind of the aftermath of the uh, of the Ukrainian famine of, of the you know the state imposed famines of the 30s, where there were lots of just wild orphan children, uh, which were called bez um wild orphans. And uh, the uh, that's in the situation Sasha ends up in as a child. He's, his his uh, parents uh, die. Uh, uh, he, as he understands that he certainly left alone and uh, on his own as an eight-year-old, and he, with a lot of other orphan kids at the same time, and they kind of grow up wild on the streets. And he's a, a, a kind of an urban feral child, uh, and uh, most of those kids die, but he and a few others actually manage to survive and uh, uh, and. and make it out of that, but not very far out of it, because they're kind of the basis of organized crime on the planet. Yeah. And it's, um, humans are a decided underclass on the planet where Sasha grew up. He doesn't, he'd never even been to Earth, right? Right. He, he, uh, he actually comes to, he got to Earth at the very end of the thing. They sent him there for, for the medical treatment at the very end of the novel, but he'd never been to Earth before then. He'd, uh, he was born on this uh, planet. Um, his parents had immigrated uh, from Ukraine. Um, but humans, yes, are decided underclass on that planet and really in uh, this interstellar society. Um, and so maybe we should talk a little bit about the, about the society. Because yeah. Tell us about the stellar commonwealth and, and what's going on politically and such. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been around for three, about 300 years, um, but They've only contacted humans about a hundred years prior to this hundred human years, and this novel, in terms of uh, our time, is set about a hundred and twenty years in the future. Um, so, in our timeline, twenty years in the future, we're contacted by a, a star-faring interstellar culture, um, and they don't conquer us. You know, we can join or not join. We dis- we elect to join. There are. We are the sixth intelligent race that has joined the, the Commonwealth. That's the only intelligent races that have been discovered. But we're definitely on the bottom rung of the ladder. Um, technologically, we're behind. Um, and, uh, and they have a pretty, pretty good lock legally on the technology. And that's kind of the, the condition of joining the Commonwealth, is you have to agree to these, uh, uh, to their uh, intellectual property covenants. Yeah, um, and it's it's. I mean, it's basically the the rule that the the rules are against us. Oh yeah, the humans. It's definitely rigged against. I mean, it's rigged against all of all of the intelligent races except the Varoki, uh, who are the dominant, who are the 
dominant race, they're the ones who actually discovered interstellar jump drive. They're the only, and they still control that technology. So other people uh, have have ships, but the drives are leased from uh, the large trading houses that are that build jump drives yeah, on the Burkey. Kind, of, kind of like an interstellar um, company town kind of thing going on, I guess. It, it, it is, yeah, it is kind of, it is kind of. Um, and that's uh, kind of an ongoing, that's kind of the ongoing friction here is that all of the, it, the, the Verrocchi haven't conquered anyone. Um, they, they, everything is voluntary, but they've really got, if, if you want to play on, on the, if you want to engage in interstellar travel, the only way to do it is with this jump drive. Nobody knows how it works because it's considered a trade secret, and it's a very closely held secret. And that, of course, is one of the ongoing threads in this whole series of, of story to be. That's kind of the, the thread that runs through these in terms of how the Verrocchi maintain their control, economic control, over the other races. Yeah, it's very well guarded with them. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> with some toxins. Is um, the, what is the technological level otherwise of, of the civilization? Aside from, um, aside from, uh, the jump drive itself, which is which is the which is the uh, um, the, the big MacGuffin in the series. I mean, how that works, and, and at some point, um, I actually know how it works. At some point, maybe that'll show up in a story. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure it will. Probably in the third Sasha book. When, but uh, um, I, I don't want to go there yet. Um, but aside from that, it's really about where you would where I would expect our technology to be in about 100 years. Um, there's, there's no major uh, scientific advance other than the jump drive. Um, what there are are pretty reasonable engineering advances. Now, those engineering advances over the course of 100 years um, are, are, can be pretty spectacular, but there's nothing like any, you know, any gravity or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's really our understanding of the physical universe engineered much better. I mean, our material technology is better. So the the principal means of travel to orbit is by is, is by orbital elevator instead of the, by beanstalks. Uh, they're called needles in in the in the stories. Um, but you don't use rockets to get to orbit. That's really inefficient and costly. Um, but an eleva- a space elevator is is pretty economical once you've got the material technology to build it. And that's true of a lot of the stuff in it. it is, it's mostly just engineering advances, uh, not big scientific breakthroughs. Yeah. Sasha is, uh, is, is um, he uses a gun, and, and the gun is a projectile weapon, right? That's right. It's, a, it's electrically activated powder? or what's Yeah, a, a Gauss pistol, yeah, which is a, it's basically an electric linear accelerator that throws a flechette. Uh-huh. Flechette, um, but but yeah, it's basically a projectile weapon. Um, there are there are some lasers, but they're not as expensive. Or in a lot of ways, I mean, it, it, it's hard to beat punching a hole in something in terms of yeah, especially with that much kinetic energy. The uh huh, that's right. Yeah, but the uh, the they do have these very nasty neural cudgels, also. <laughs> A neural wand is like a polite word for a cattle prod. Uh, and they also have neural pistols, um, which are, somebody's actually, I forget, I've got it written down somebody, somebody's actually figured out how to build them right now and is building them. But a neural pistol is nothing more than a wireless taser. And, uh, and, and the, way it, the way it works wirelessly is that it, it's got a laser in it. And the laser... Uh, when you when you fire it, the laser does a, a superheated chunk of atmosphere that's ionized. It's conductive, um, so you shoot this thing at somebody, and that and then the electronic current goes down that conducting tunnel. Um, so I, I always wondered how do you do the you know, in, in in science fiction? There's always stunners, you know. How do you how do you do that? Well, somebody's actually figured out a way to do it with our with existing technology that we have right now. So so that's part of the the universe as well. Well, tell us how the tell us then how the uh, the star drive is guarded. How come people can't just go reverse engineer it? Why can't humans do that? 
Yeah, uh, and that and that's kind of the uh, that would be the first thing you'd think is the, the, sure. No, the, the broker aren't talking about how this works because it's a trade secret. But why don't you just take one and crack it open and look what's going on? Yeah, inside. like a knitting machine from old England, and take it over to Boston. And <laughs> that's right. Yeah, um, and on the the rare occasions when by accident these the, the well the jump drives are like closed modules that you lease, and if and you get. Uh, if, if it if it's malfunctions, you don't open it up and fix it. You replace it with a different module and then uh, replace it out. And when whenever these things have been breached, um, it turns out there's a terrifically powerful neurotoxin uh, uh, back uh, uh, in it that um, not only will kill you, but it will also eat through most seals. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, and it's uh, the, the way that any sort of contamination of this thing is dealt with is usually just take the starship and dump it into a star um, <laughs> the, uh, to make sure that, not, that whatever this thing is doesn't get out. So it's, um, it's certain, nobody's figured out a way to look inside this thing and reverse engineer it. And, and, the, of course, the other thing is that these things, since you're not, you don't own it, you lease it, they're, uh, they're very rigorously controlled. Uh, in terms of who's got which component, and if any nation uh, decides to try to even try to mess around with this, they're not going anywhere in space anymore um, because they're never going to get you know they're never going to get a jump drive to play with again. Um, so so there's you know there's some legal there's some economic things, but there's also a um, a really really difficult uh, neurotoxin guard um, to get around that's that's killed a few people. Well, cool. And now we're on. Uh, we're we're not on Pizkatan, right? We're on another planet. Right. We're on Hazakatu, which is the Viroki homeworld, right. the the economic, cultural, and political center of the Kotohas, the stellar commonwealth. And the there's sort of a large urban thing called Sakato City. Uh, Sakato City is the capital of uh, of. Baka, which is the largest and most important of the Viroki nations, and all of the and all of the member states, including humans, the Viroki, everybody, none of them have a unified racial government or species government or planetary government. Uh, there are nation states, just as there are today. And the United States is a nation state that's referred to in the. It's not the United States of North America, but it's pretty close to the same thing. And uh, Canada obviously has conquered us here in the U.S. <laughs> That's it, eh? Yes. <laughs> um, the, actually, the, the uh, United States of North America includes Canada and Mexico. And uh, there were some, I don't know how far you want to get into this sort of kind of geek history, but I mean, the, 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 uh, there, were tw- there are 27 major political entities on the Viroki homeworld, Hazakatu, when they formed the Kotohas, the Stellar Commonwealth. So now, whenever anybody enters, another race enters, they get 27 votes in the Watt. And they can divide it up however they want to, but it has to be proportional by population. But then they, you know, how they actually come up with political units to handle that is up to them. Um, so Earth has 27 political units, some of which are very, very, very loose confederations that don't do much cooperatively except elect a Watt, the, the, the legislator. Um, but the United States of North America has the population for two of those. Um, so when those, uh, when Canada, the United States of America, and Mexico formed this new federation 80 years before the novel takes place, they actually have two uh, two seats in the Watt. Um, so there's some, and so there's a lot of different approaches to how this, uh, how people divided up and dealt with this new political reality. Um, there's no one. There's, there is no one-size-fits-all in any of this in terms of how people um, have worked out uh, their politics. Yeah, well, that, I mean, that's kind of the theme of the of the whole series so far is the, the diversity of and the incredible uh, differences that come down to individuals and, and making big value judgments and stereotypes doesn't work in this world. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it's one of the things that I think has been a failing of, and I mean, I'm, I'm a science fiction guy from when I was a little kid, 
uh, back in the 50s, and I first stumbled across it, and I love science fiction, but I think one area that science fiction, the vision of science fiction has failed is in, underst- is, is in approaching the diversity of alien life, because if you look at how much diversity there is culturally and, and linguistically and, and everything else in, just on Earth, um, then when we go out in the stars, we run into these guys, and, they, and it's like they all came from the same town in Michigan, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, there's just billions of the All these aliens are kind of the same. And I, I, it, for me, it was that was always a little hard selling. So I'm trying to... Uh, I, my vision of these races that we run into is that they are every bit as diverse as we are. Um, I, I remember one guy asked me a, a while back, he, he, I was, we were talking about... Um, the Viroki, and he says, well, do they have a creation story? And I said, they have hundreds of creation stories. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's not just like one culture. It just happens to be the species that evolved on this planet, and they've got lots of cultures. Yeah. Well, the um, uh, Sakato City is made up of these arcologies, which you describe a lot in the book, and they're, they're really, I sort of picture these Blade Runner-like giant buildings, um, can you describe how the how they live, and their slums as well? Well, there's yeah, there's slums. It, 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 it's they're engineered communities that have really outgrown the engineering. I mean, nothing. It, it's really hard to anticipate everything. But the archaeologies, uh, there's uh, I think there's six of them, six of them or seven. I, I should know. <laughs> Since I invented this, uh, let me look at the look at the okay. map here. Look at this map. Yes. One, two, three, yes. five, uh, two, four, seven. There are seven, seven. Eco- ecologies in Sakato City, and each one of them has between a half a million and a million and a half people living in it. Um, and so uh, their typical footprint is more than a kilometer on the ground, but also usually about a, col- uh, a kilometer or taller uh, up. Uh, so they're pretty massive skyscrapers, but they're not just skyscrapers. I mean, some of them are pretty squat pyramids. Um, there's a variety of different shapes, but um, they're all self-contained um, systems uh, that have um, their own power generation, uh, residential areas. Uh, um, and and if, if you kind of look up arcology, there's, a, there's an architectural movement now to kind of build arcologies, although most of them aren't vision being this large, but some, but some of them are. Um, the... Uh, but, but each one of these, it, then they're linked by maglev tracks, uh, maglev uh, rail, rail tracks. And, uh, uh, but then the area in between, there's, they're separated by several kilometers, each of these arcologies, and the seven of them that make up this city complex. The area in between has kind of become the overflow population area, and it's a pretty grim slum, uh, kind of at, at, at the base of these massive, towering, shining arcologies. Um, and there's a lot of humans living in the slums, but there's also a lot of Viroki in the slums too. I mean, it's not a, um, it's it's not a, There's there's some issues that this whole culture is facing right now. It's not. It hasn't. Uh, the, the other thing that struck me is people talk about societies that have been the same for hundreds of years, and I've never seen that. We have no record of societies ever being the same for hundreds of years. Something, you know, they go on for a while, but they get broken. Things stop working. Things change, um, and this this society, this culture's, the society is in a is, is in a tough spot right now in terms of how things are not quite working the way they did twenty or thirty years ago. Well, tell us about the the Viroki and uh, and and maybe the the Zacks and uh, the Viroki are just physically they're they're they kind of look lizard like. Some characteristics that humans, the, of course, they have nothing to, you know, in relation with lizards, but they they look, uh, they have they're hairless, um, their skin is uh, kind of iridescent, uh, it, 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 so uh, and, and they have uh, um, very large uh, m- mobile ears that are very expressive, and their and their skin tends to change. Uh, with their emotion. I mean, ours does as well. We flush with embarrassment or anger or something, but there's a, a bit more so than ours. Um, they're, they, they're a bit taller than we are. You know, uh, they average two or a little over two meters in height. Um, so they're not enormous, but they're, they, they, they make 
they'd be great basketball players, you know. And, um, they, uh, but they, but those are the main differences. I mean, they're facially they, uh, facially they look a lot like us. They don't have they don't tend to have prominent noses. They tend to have uh, flat noses. But but their eyes essentially constructed the same as ours. Their sensory organs are are clustered the same way ours are. Um, and their internal plumbing is pretty similar too. Um, there's a point in one of the books. I think it's actually it's the one I'm working on right now. That where somebody mentions that um, even though their proteins and body chemistry are different, mechanically there's only so many ways to plumb an upright uh, biped uh, that makes sense. And you know, theirs is, is vaguely is generally kind of similar to ours. Um, so that's the that's the uh, the Viroki. The Zacks are a bit. Uh, uh, and the Zacks are an inter- I, I think the uh, another really interesting race. They're the ones who were discovered right before us, so they're like one rung above us on the ladder, but they're still pretty far down, and we're kind of catching up with them quick. And so there's some friction with Zacks, uh, but the uh, they're much more massive. They're tall, but they're also uh, um, physically more massive than the kind of fairly slender Viroki. They have uh, two mouths. Um, the, the bottom one is a chewing, eating uh, mouth. Uh, the upper one is actually a, a, an evolved blowhole, but it's uh, um, more um, highly evolved enough that mostly they speak from the upper mouth. Um, the, uh, although you find out in, uh, in, in the, uh, the book I'm working on right now that they actually can speak from the lower one as well, and their native language at home involves using both mouths, but that's impossible for anyone to reproduce uh, who doesn't have two mouths. So they have this very simple thing called Jawa, which is their kind of trade language that they use when speaking to uh, to other species, and that's how humans communicate with them is Jawa. And it's a pretty simple kind of crude language, and it, 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 early on in the books you kind of have the sense that these guys are pretty crude guys, but you're going to find out that their actual language is so sophisticated and so involved uh, that they just have to dumb it down for everybody else to even be able to communicate with them. So uh, I, I think the I think the Zacks and the Zacks are are pretty surly and, and kind of physically disgusting. Uh, uh, people humans think of them as troll like, although they don't they're not as anthropomorphic as that. Um, but they, yeah, I, I, I like the Zacks. And you probably get that sense, too, as you go through the books, that I, I really have, a, I, I kind of like the Zacks. They have a very dry sense of humor and a, and a, and a real strong sense of the ironic. Yeah, um, and they, uh, I love the way Sasha describes how <laughs> how they vocalize, the um, the effect it can have when they're speaking oh, yeah. loudly. <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's, since the mouth they speak from is, of course, a, 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 an evolved blowhole, a nasal passage, their voice tends to sound very nasal when they talk, but also he says when humans get excited and they talk, you get, sometimes you get a little spit on you. you know, same thing with Zach's, except that's not spit. That's not spit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, one of the like we were talking about, one of the themes of the book is is the variety is of individuals. Our bad guy, um, Gaunt, uh, is a traditional. He didn't believe in this. Um, how are the? Who is he? How is he related to Viroki society, um, or the particular one he's in? And sort of uh, explain how the Viroki are divided up, because a lot of this book has to do with with um, changes. In their society, uh, well, well, they have, of course, they have you know, twenty-seven uh, nations, some larger and more powerful than others. Um, but there's also a, a, this series of very large trading houses, which are the kind of the basis of the uh, the Viroki economies. And some of the trading houses are more closely associated with some of the governments. And some people, in fact, would argue that some, that some of the governments are surrogates for some of the trading houses. Um, so the, the E-Track, uh, uh, the E-Track, the Simki E-Track is one of the largest, one of the big star drive manufacturers, big trading house, and Twiza is the heir to a big chunk of the ownership of the Simki E-Track um, holdings. Uh, that's uh, that's Twiza who he's guarding, that, and that's causing a lot of friction because 
a lot of the traditionalists don't like the idea that a, a Viroqui, A, female, because it's a very patriarchal society, and B, a, a female raised, being raised by humans is going to end up having such an enormous economic control. That's, that's an ongoing point of friction. Uh, but there's also this, uh, this friction between the fact that the, the, the very, very wealthy trading houses are controlling the governments and the average Baroque who've been on top have had everybody else to kind of lord it over for a while are now kind of getting squeezed by current economic times. And there's some, there's some frictions developing there, some internal fault lines. And Gott uh, comes along and is a guy who primarily preaches an anti-human. You know, humans are the cause of a lot of our problems and has whipped up a lot of anger against humans. But he's not that crazy about the corporations either, and they've treated him as basically a tool to uh, get their job done and de- deflect attention from them. And um, as, as the novel kind of carries on, that's not working. You know, he's not as reliable a tool as they had originally thought. Um, but he's, uh, he's his own guy. Uh, he has a vision of Viroqui society that sees, that really believes that the, that the kind of pluralistic approach of the Kotohas, the stellar commonwealth, where all of the races have a vote, have kind of equal representation, is the wrong way to go, that the Viroqui control all this technology, that they should never have shared it with everybody else, and that uh, they, need, they need to have a much more dominant position. Uh, and, and, of course, their position already is pretty dominant, but it's still not dominant enough for him. So that's, I mean, does that, does that answer the question? That's a lot of the friction points. Yeah, there. sure. And he's, um, some, we also have a sympathetic and friendly uh, Viroki, who, and especially um, uh, Theon, which is not really his name, yeah. um, who's uh, Sasha's friend. He's the head of a faction of Viroki, right? Or he's a diplomat. He's a member of the of the counselors. Um, of, of the the, uh, the, uh, the there's a uh, within the Kotohas, which is the you know the stop which is you know, its governance is dominated by the Vroki, but it's not exclusively Vroki. But within that, um, there's the core of counselors who are diplomats and uh, uh, and uh, um, and advisors uh, of of the executive council, and he's very prominent in that. He's he's been on a lot of diplomatic and, and executive assignments, um, and they're certainly a moderate force, a moderate voice uh, within the Kotohas. And then the other major faction in the Kotohas leadership is what's called the uh, um, the Provost Corps of the Kogojak, which the Kogojak is the armed forces of the Kotohas. Um, and that is a much more, um, I won't say hard line. I mean, it is hard line, but, but the question is, what is the line? They are, um, they're the, the provost's primary concern is maintaining uh, the Kotohas as a functioning uh, uh, institution. And anything which threatens that, um, they're pretty, they, they believe in taking a pretty ruthless uh, uh, approach to, um, and that's uh, headed up by a guy by the name of uh, Yignatu Iloyolan, um, who you would meet for the first time in, in this novel, and who takes a personal interest in, in Sasha. And it's never a good idea when the secret police take a personal interest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and stare at you while they're thinking. That's guess, That creeped Sasha out. But, yeah, but although uh, Iloyolan... It, and is is definitely adversarial towards um, Vion's faction, the the, the the core of counselors. I, I don't view Eloy Olan as a villain, um, but he's definitely dangerous, <laughs> and he's a guy you don't want to get on the wrong side of. But you know, he's he, within his within his own frame of reference, he's doing. Uh, uh, he, he's he's doing the right thing, and that's all he's really interested. He's just very ruthless about doing what he sees as the right thing. Yeah, I mean, he's a sort of ally. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sort of, uh, you know, in an odd sort of way. It, but but if so, only temporarily, you yeah. know, only only situationally. He can um, it, the uh, yeah. I don't see him in the long term as as an ally. Um, well, it's hard to. I mean, it's hard to talk too much about the main 
plot of the book because it's too much spoiler involved. But but there is a there's a revolution, <laughs> and and Sasha is kind of on the side of order, right? In in a bizarre kind of way, he is um, the uh, he is uh, the. Uh, it, it's, it, and it's kind of the question of choosing um, how you want to change things. I mean, uh, Sasha's, th- there's a lot of people who want to change things in a lot of different ways in this book, um, and, and a lot of people willing to uh, blow stuff up to get it done. But uh, Sasha, Sasha ends up taking a, a surprisingly moderate view of where they should be going and where humans' immediate best interests lie. Um, and that puts him in conflict with a lot of the humans in the book too. Yeah, he's he's not really an idealist of the. Uh, he he's romantic perhaps, but he's not an idealist about human nature or anybody else's nature, right? Uh, yeah, I think that that's an interesting way to put it. Um, he's a uh, he's not an idealist, but he's not a cynic either. Yeah. Um, he's not he, he's not a pessimist. I mean, when he says ends up saying to. Um, what he ends up saying to someone who who accuses him of being um, uh, naive in his views and, and saying that you know he thinks that somehow everybody's the same underneath his answer is no I I don't think everybody's the same I think everybody's different you know you're the one he's saying just to God who says you're the one who thinks everybody's kind of the same in a couple categories that all Verrocchi are the same all humans are the same all Zacks are the same and uh Sasha's view is that you, know, you, 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 you kind of meet people one at a time, and you have to kind of take them on the basis that you find them. And, yeah. and, and, and sometimes he even changes his mind. Uh, I love the, the, the interaction with the thugs that try to <laughs> take him down. <laughs> oh, Bela Ripken and, uh, and Pablo, yeah. the, the, two, the, the, the two thugs that kidnap him. Yeah. Are those two, are the yeah, two? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're trying. They're they're not really working for what's his name, Skull Stall, but um, oh, they yeah, kind of want to be. But they, <laughs> well, they want to though. They figure if they do something good enough, maybe he'll hire them. He can. They can work for the hmm. for the big thug. Yeah. yeah. Sasha kind of gets. I mean, he even though they're trying to hurt him, uh, he has a, a sort of. He thinks of, they're sort of pets to him. Almost they become. <laughs> it's. Yeah, well, he, he recognizes himself when he was younger in them. Uh, maybe not in Pablo so much, because Pablo's pretty thick, and, 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 and Sasha's a pretty sharp guy, but he kind of recognizes a little bit of himself in the guy he starts off calling Lefty, but his name is Bela Ripken. Um, so, yeah, and, and he understands kind of the world they came from. And so he, it's not, he's not unsympathetic to them, even though for a while... He's definitely in a life and death adversarial situation with them. But yeah. I think part of the fact that he, well, I, I don't want to go. Do, we don't want to spoil too much on that. No. Yeah, so. But but he does. Uh, they do ev- evoke in him laying out uh, his basic philosophy of ha- of of management to stall of, of personnel management. Yeah, which I yeah. tell us about that because I, I found that pretty <laughs> yeah, uh, that's one of the things that's insightful. Everybody, uh, it's a. Uh, his, uh, he, he says that uh, there are, um, the one guy, Bela Ripken, is, he says is intelligent and he's energetic. Um, and uh, the other guy, Pablo, is stupid and lazy. And he says both of those are useful. And the fellow he's trying to say, how is stupid and lazy? Yeah, those guys, you can give, give them a simple job and, and they're not going to, you know, they'll do it. And they'll never wander off and do something else because they're too lazy. To, you, know, you can always kind of rely on them not to surprise you. And, the, uh, and, this, this, and so they go, oh, so the other guy, Bela, he'll make a good leader someday, right? Because he's uh, intelligent and energetic. No, no, you don't want, you want lazy, intelligent guys as leaders. <laughs> the energetic guys have too many ideas. They're your idea guys, but you want lazy, intelligent guys to kind of rein them in because they'll always find the easiest way to do stuff, and they won't take chances. Um, yeah, and, and, of course, they say, oh, all right, that makes sense. So, but that leaves uh, energetic and stupid. What do you do with them? 
get rid of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they'll, they'll screw everything up. Yeah, it, it is a it, it's a nice little uh, it's a nice little thing. I, I did not invent this. I did not invent this. It's uh, this was the system Frederick the Great used to assign officers. That's where this system originates. Um, well, you can't argue with that. <laughs> Yeah, you can't argue with Frederick the Great. Uh, Said, you know, intelligent, energetic officers make good staff officers. Intelligent, Mm -hmm. lazy officers make good field commanders. The uh, lazy, stupid ones you make as junior commanders and command garrisons and stuff like that. And the lazy, I mean, and and the intelligent, uh, the the stupid, energetic ones get rid of. So, uh, so yeah, that start that that comes from Frederick the Great himself. That's um, uh, and it. It, the the whole interaction has kind of a feel of Elmore Leonard, to, who's one of my favorite writers, um, as well. I I love that in particular uh, those two characters. I mean, more than to say it reminds you of Elmore Leonard. Maybe if you said it reminded you of Raymond Chandler, that'd be you know even better. But yeah, <laughs> Leonard's a wonderful writer, or was a wonderful. He passed away too, but just last year. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you I'm, I'm glad you think that because Leonard really is a uh, Leonard has a good ear. Um, for um, the kind of casual criminal um, conversation, he has a real good ear for that. Oh yeah, this was more very much more romantic and and tough guy, and you know they kind of made the hard boiled genre. But Leonard's stuff is just uh, well, very good. it's really good. Yeah. So, um, what are you working on now? These at the moment, I know I'm reading something you wrote recently. Yes, you are. You're uh, you're reading a uh, line of battle, which is uh, set. It, it's not a Sasha novel, but it's set in Sasha's universe. It's set one year after the end of Come the Revolution, uh, and the the events of Come the Revolution influence the novel. But the character, the main character, is uh, I've I've wanted for a long time to write a space navy novel, and. Uh, Line of bat. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, chain of command is the name of it. Chain of command uh, is that. It's the space navy in question is the United States Navy. Um, so it's loaded with U.S. Navy tradition and procedure in the way, but it's in space, um, and uh, modified somewhat. But I think, uh, um, but I think pretty reasonably. Um, and the, and and it, it, it's uh, it deals with the planet Katak, which was a point of contention in the first novel. It's mentioned as a point of contention in Come the Revolution. It's a natural point of friction between the humans and Viroki. Um, for and people who've read the novels don't understand that. And if, if you haven't, would well, just trust me. It really is. I mean, it's it's this this kind of open sore between them uh, that ends up uh, coming to war. Now, it's not humans against the Viroki. It's a coalition of several human nations against the Ubakai, the uh, the Republic of Baka, um, and uh, so that so the novel is about that. It's about a continuing issue, issue of this whole secret jump drive, uh, the, the the informational control of that, um, with the, which is which is a theme that runs through this whole series of books. Um, but that's a. Uh, uh, and and and, you know, that, and and it's also a story about you know, a young officer trying to kind of come to grips with himself and and, and his position in uh, in the navy and and, and, the, and the responsibilities of command and what that really means um, when he's pushed into a position uh, that he's not really prepared for because I mean that's what happens in war sometimes is you know people get killed and and all of a sudden you have to take over and you're not necessarily ready for it but you got to do it anyway um so that's that's what uh that's what i'm working on right now cool um how do you um how do you integrate your uh like game design with with writing or do you or is it is there a continuum um how how do you mean i mean i i i I don't I'm, I'm, actually, I'm still doing some game design, but there's really, really a very, for the most part, a very different, um, writing is a lot different than designing a game. Um, I, the, the, the parts that are in common, I suppose, are the research and the, and the notion of building, in, in a game you have to build a persuasive interpretation of historical events usually. 
in, in a novel, you have to build a persuasive interpretation, a setting, and characters were persuasive, either for contemporary or historical, or in this case, science fiction. But uh, that's very similar in terms of trying to figure out, and usually it involves a lot of research, what's plausible in technology, how a society works really, um, and how people interact with that. I, that part's common, but I'm not sure that's a, actually what you're asking. Well, it, that is part of it. The, the other part is, 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 does it tap different parts of your creativity? Um, it, yeah, it does. Um, the, the common parts, like I say, are the... Let, let me, this may be a way to put it. The common parts of the creativity are the public parts. Um, uh, the the, uh, the world-building parts, um, uh, how technology works, uh, how things interact, what the mechanics of a world or a society or an economy are. That's very kind of common mental parts. The uncommon parts are the private parts, that, that, and that's the, the interior stuff in a character, which is, I think, you know, the richest part of a novel, and the other parts necessary to make that part believable to, to make the story believable but but i think the real payoff is is that in, that, that interior what's going on inside a character um and that's completely different there's none of that's not really part of uh that kind of private personal part of it is not there in game design at all yeah well in uh sasha is um has a family in in this one he's um He's there's a by the way I've noticed a lot of like surrogate dad guarding daughters in every book you've written so far. <laughs> Is that a theme? That... <laughs> yeah, actually that's true. There's the issue of family, but usually not um, a traditional family. Uh, Is it, kind of and, and people's place in family is something I come back to a lot. I think. Uh, um, for, you know, for, I don't know what the Freudian explanation for that would be, but. <laughs> But yeah, there's a uh, well. Child in danger is always a good plot. <laughs> child, in, yeah, it is. It it is. Um, but it's but it's not. It, it, child in danger, of course, is a good um, motivation. Um, but kind of the inner issue that all of these people face is how they, um, what their obligations are, or what their responsibilities are uh, to these people that, uh, that that have become part of their lives. Uh, and, and that's really one of the, and this is not not for spoiling, but that's one of the big issues that come the revolution. Kind of to my surprise, ends up being about it's about a lot of different things. But one of them is um, this notion of the responsibility we have to our family and, and the people we make our family. That doesn't not necessarily just formal family, but as you go through life, you people you make people part of your family. Um, the uh, and. What our responsibilities are to them, and what and what constitutes a, abandonment? Um, you know, that because there's a, abandonment's an issue in this story too. You know, how how people abandon each other, meaning to or not meaning to, and and and, and what is that? And what, where does that leave us? You know, and, and how do you deal with that? So, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, that whole issue of that. that these really important bonds that we end up making with people as we go through life, and uh, and, and kind of the care and feeding of those, and, and how it's it's not as easy as it looks, you know. Yeah, well, uh, it it makes Sasha a very sympathetic badass. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's a he's the nicest uh, uh, borderline sociopathic homicidal drug dealer I've ever read about. Yeah. What's that? Well, uh, the book is Come the Revolution by Frank Chadwick. This is the sequel to How Dark the World Becomes, featuring gangster ex-soldier and protector, Sasha Naradnyo. Uh, Frank, thanks very much for being with us. Thanks very much, Tony. It was, it was a lot of fun. I, I always enjoy talking about these books. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free 
or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Okay, Steve said, looking at Sophia's notes. I think we've got the beginnings of a working governmental organization here. Each boat votes and shares materials on the basis of shares. Captains have the right to choose their crews. Crews can call for a vote of no confidence and oust the captain, but since, if it fails, the crew can then be fired by the captain, better be careful with that. New captains are sent to the captain's board from the Commodore and must be approved by a majority of the captain's board. Currently, that's me, Chris, and Mike. Captains have pre-modern rules of the sea, but do not have the right of corporal or capital punishment. All lower-order crimes, petty theft, assault, fighting among the crew, are handled at the discretion of the captain of the boat. All higher-order felonies, notably rape, mutiny, or murder, must have a trial by jury or, if that's infeasible, agreement of three captains who have been shown good evidence. Captains follow the orders of the, uh, Commodore. Currently, one Stephen John Smith, captain of the Tina's Toy, in all normal day-to-day -day operations of the flotilla. Newly rescued persons do not have the right to vote until agreeing to become members of the flotilla and being accepted as full crew members. All large decisions are by vote of the captain's board or all flotilla members, depending. More complete charter to be written up at a later time. Charter to be voted on by straight vote of all members of the flotilla. And I foresee a couple more meetings, at least at long range. Persons who choose not to be with the flotilla will be organised in groups and then at some point put off on functioning boats to do whatever the hell they want. Shunning, Paula said. Should such persons attack or steal from the flotilla, pretty much all we've got right now is shunning or capital punishment. Cross that bridge. Motion, Chris said. I motion that this organisation hereafter take the name Wolf's Floating Circus. Can I get a second? Damn, Patrick said. I was hoping for Sequest. Second, Paula said. Get me a screen printer and I can make an awesome t-shirt for that. I think you need to call for a vote, Chris said, grinning. I'm trying to remember Robert's rules of order to see if I can quash it, Steve said, frowning. Okay, okay. All in favor... Well, that was a pain in the ass, Steve said, as the Victoria dropped its final anchor in Jews Bay. Tug operations turned out to be anything but straightforward. Trying to do it with an untrained crew had turned out to be a right pain in the ass. But they'd finally gotten the tug into place. Jews Bay was about the most protected spot in the complex of islands that made up Bermuda. At least the most protected that they could tow the Victoria into safely. There were some tighter and better protected creeks, but there was no way they were getting the Victoria into them. The edges of the bay were littered with small craft, proof that sheltered was a relative term. The tropical storm that had made their life hell had driven them all onto the islands. And while there were open areas, areas free from obvious zombies, on the surrounding islands, just scanning, they could see zombies moving around. Not much, and not aggressively but zombies were there. As soon as all of the anchors on the Victoria were down, the Cooper moved up cautiously alongside. The new crew of the Victoria, four volunteers who had been supernumerary on the toy and Cooper, started inexpertly throwing balloon fenders over the side. As one that was badly secured fell in the water, Captain Mike started bellowing from the wheelhouse. One of these days we will have to find real professionals to figure this out. Steve said. That'll be the day, Sophia said. But to do that, we need to clear more boats, Steve said. As soon as we're replenished, back to sea. Da, Sophia said quietly. You're serious about me taking a boat? I'll need to find the right crew, Steve said. 
I don't want you kidnapped in a mutiny, but yeah, we need captains. And you've got more experience than anyone but Chris and Mike. And Mike's content to sit on the Victoria, so... Yeah. Thanks, Da, Sophia said. Thank me after you've had the responsibility for a while, Steve said, rubbing his forehead. You okay, Da? Sophia asked. There are people dying out there right now, Steve said. There were people dying that we could have saved a long time ago. I'm regretting just hiding for so long. We'll get there, Da, Sophia said. Toy, Victoria, Mike growled over the radio. Toy, Sophia responded. Now that we've got this rat fuck cleared up, come alongside port. We'll start filling you up. Roger, Vic, Sophia said. Da, you want to get ready to handle the lines? Yes, ma'am. Steve said, grinning. While we're here, Steve said, looking at the coast of the nearby island. What are you thinking? Stacy asked. Nothing worse than going to a concert. Steve slipped over the side of the dinghy into the water carefully. All he was carrying was a pistol, in the event there were some zombies around. Mostly, he plans on outswimming them if it came to it. One last time, Faith said. She was rigged up in case swimming didn't work. You sure about this? I can see the utility, Steve said. I think it's a good idea. If I can't find any, or I get eaten, it was a bad idea. He quietly swam ashore, keeping an eye out in every direction he could. The zombies seemed to barely notice human activity in the harbor, except at night when there was light. Then they'd lined the harbor trying to find a way to the boats. There was plenty of junk along the shore, but what he was looking for wouldn't be found there. He let his nose do the work for him, moving carefully through the sea grapes of Gama Island, following the smell of rot. It was unsurprisingly a human corpse, probably a zombie that had lost the zombie-eat-zombie battle of survival, and very putrid. It was covered in flies, which weren't of interest to him, but it was also covered in small black beetles. Those he collected quickly and popped into a Ziploc bag. He stopped as he heard movement in the trees and looked up. There was a zombie crouched under the bushes, a young black woman. She was regarding him fairly, apparently trying to work out if he was worth attacking. Steve stood up slowly and then leaned forward, raising his shoulders and grunting at her. She ducked back into the bushes and disappeared. Steve snuck back through the bushes, trying not to think about the interplay in which he'd just engaged. He had to pay attention to keeping alive, but it was interesting nonetheless. Seriously? Faith said, looking at the beetles crawling over the tuna guts. That's it? You'll see, Steve said. They'll be useful. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a grab bag of goodies including a Che Guevara print mug filled with unsweetened aboriginal hot chocolate and a little ayahuasca for flavor. Stirred with the ice pick used to off Trotsky and much thanks and kudos for Frank Chadwick, author of Come the Revolution. Happy Holidays, Merry Joy Christmas, and Happy New Year from all of us at Bain. Please join us in 2016 here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. Free Radio Hour is brought to you by Bain Books Audio Drama, presenting dramatized audio plays of the best science fiction and fantasy with a professional cast and cinema quality soundtracks. Now available, Eric Flint's Islands based on the novella by Eric Flint. Also available, Larry Correa's Detroit Christmas, based on the novella 
by Larry Correa. Set in the world of the Grim Noir Chronicles at BaneEbooks.com. Just put Islands and Detroit Christmas in the search bar and enter a world of listening pleasure. Bane Books Audio Drama. Thank you.